the world over. A year ago, four cardinals asked the Pope to clarify his pastoral teaching regarding communion for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics. Their request went unanswered. This week, those same four cardinals renewed their request for dialogue and clarity from the Pope. One of the reporters who broke the story is with us tonight. He joins us from Rome via satellite. He's the Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Edward Penton. Edward, thanks for being there. Uh, I want to jump right into this letter. Now, this comes from Cardinal Kafara, and he writes on behalf of Cardinal Brandmuller, Cardinal Raymond Burke, uh, Cardinal Meisner, Joaquin Meisner, and himself. And he writes, It is with some trepidation that I address myself to your holiness during these days of the Easter season. This letter went out in May. We wish to begin by renewing our absolute dedication and our unconditional love for the chair of Peter and for your august person in whom we recognize the successor of Peter and the vicar of Jesus, the sweet Christ on earth, as St. Catherine of Siena was fond of saying. We do not share in the slightest the position of those who consider the see of Peter vacant. I want to start there. Why, at the beginning of this letter, have what is essentially a reiteration of their fidelity to the Pope? Well, Raymond, it's really because they're very keen to obviously do this out of respect and love for the Petrine ministry and for the Pope. They, they really are. Uh, that's their first concern. And so that's, uh, that's why they put it at the top. And they want to keep the channels of dialogue open with, this, with the Holy Father. They don't want to discredit him in any way or make him feel uh, humiliated in any way. They just want to do this out of love for him and out of deep concern for what they call the grave situation in the church um, due to the, the conflicting uh, readings of Amoris Letizia in bishops' conferences around the world. Yeah, I want to put this up so the audience can see it, and this is really the marrow of their letter. Cardinal Kafara writes uh, on behalf of his um, brother cardinals, the, the three other cardinals. Uh, on September 19th, 2016, we delivered to Your Holiness and to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith five dubia, those are questions, asking you to resolve uncertainties and to bring clarity on some points of the post-synodal apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia. Not having received any response from Your Holiness, we have reached the decision to ask you respectfully and humbly for an audience. Together, if Your Holiness would like, we attach, as is the practice, an audience sheet in which we present the two points we wish to discuss with you. Okay. Why make this public now, Edward Penton? Even Cardinal Muller, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, whom I interviewed a few weeks ago, said some of this public uh, conversation is discomforting to the Pope and rattles the Church and might be seen as being provocative. Your take? Well, I think the first thing, Raymond, is that they're frustrated uh, at not getting any response from the Holy Father at all about it. Um, but also, I think they're just very, uh, very keen, obviously, to get an answer because, as I said earlier, they're very concerned about what they're hearing from the parishes, the confusion that there is, and the salvation of souls, which is at stake. And so they feel that if they make this public, it'll answer a lot of the public's, uh, the faithful's concerns, and it'll show that actually the, the cardinals are doing something and try and reassure them in that. So mm -hmm. this is there's a sort of a two-pronged uh, reason, two, two reasons here for doing it. Edward, uh, and we're talking to Edward Penton of the National Catholic Register. You've reported in recent days, and have been covering this really for the last year, we've been seeing individual bishops, cardinals, and now bishops' conferences around the world weighing in on their interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, and on a finer point, whether to grant, and under what circumstances, to grant communion to divorced and civilly remarried Catholics without an annulment. Now, the Belgian bishops and the German bishops and the Philippine bishops and the Maltese bishops say you can rely on your conscience, and if you're accompanied by your priest, you can go to communion. We now have the Polish bishops this past week, their bishops' conference, saying no, Amoris Laetitia does not change church teaching in the least. Is this what's brought this situation to a head? The um, discontinuity and the division between one country's bishop's conference and another over this core teaching of the church. It is, because what they're concerned about, and not just the cardinals, but a theologian I talked to as well, is that there's, 
they think there's a sort of apostasy going on because apostasy creates division. And they're saying that this is why you're getting these conflicting uh, views from bishops' conferences around the world. And obviously they, they obviously want that settled. And they, their biggest concern, I think, is that, that they see Christ as the unifier, Christ as unity. And if there isn't that unity, then there's something wrong. And they want that resolved. And that, for them, the, what is wrong is this lack of clarity in Amoris Laetitia, which they feel the Pope can only, only the Pope can resolve by, by making it clear. And, and Edward, why is there a reluctance, do you think, on the part of Pope Francis? I mean, clearly he, he, he had their initial dubia. Now this new letter is being made public this week. Why the reluctance to react and to respond to something that seems so elementary? What does the church teaching about communion for divorced and remarried Catholics uh, without an annulment? Well, there are a number of theories for this, Raymond, but I think the main one is that uh, he wants this ambiguity because he, th he says that these, these issues aren't black and white and these issues have to be dealt with uh, individually, case by case, and not, not everyone can receive communion, not everyone who's divorced and remarried can receive communion, but some can, depending on the circumstances and their path of discernment. So he's, he's keeping this purposely, I think, ambiguous, so that he, these cases he thinks can be dealt with in that way. But though the critics will say though, that that goes against previous papal teachings because Familius Consortio, for example, Pope John Paul II's apostolic exhortation on the family was quite clear about this. Mm. Um, and it was very much black and white in many ways. So you, they're you, saying there's a rupture with that and it's a rupture with all the teaching went before. Mm -hmm. Do you see this, um, this story, uh, the Cardinals trying to get the Pope to react on this issue of marriage, what it means, the sacrality of marriage, do you see it in any way tied to the Pope's reformation, if you will, of the Pontifical Academy of Life, where he uh, dismissed all the members, he just appointed 45 new members, among them three individuals, one of them a priest, one a rabbi, and the other a, 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 an academic, uh, all of whom support either contraception, stem cell research, or abortion in some cases. Uh, what's the thinking here? Well, this is really about the Pope uh, having dialogue and, uh, with other people of other faiths and, and bringing in other people who, who think differently. Um, this is all part of his, his view. He, says, he said only a few years ago that he doesn't believe in, in uh, certain non-negotiable values. He thinks all values are non-negotiable, and yet he wants dialogue with other people um, to try and search for truth and, and that everything is sort of in, in flow for him. Mm. So that's why he's done that. It's, it's rather odd, though, because I, I interviewed Archbishop Pallia, the head of the academy, mm -hmm. and he reassured readers that there would be uh, uh, people on, on, the, on the academy who would be in conformity with the church's teaching and defend and promote it on life issues. Mm. So people are scratching their heads as why he's appointed three members who are actually... Uh, don't, don't conform to the church's teaching on these issues. Yeah, well, there was once a, um, a, a commitment that one had to sign on to, which uh, demonstrated that you agreed with the church teaching, and that made you a part of the Pontifical Academy for Life, mean, mainly that you support the church teaching on life. The Pope did away with that um, note of confirmation, that uh, oath, if you will. He did, and, and that's why I asked uh, Archbishop Pallia, is that a, you know, is, does that weaken or effectively neuter the academy? Mm -hmm. And he said that answer, that no, it doesn't. In fact, he thinks it's stronger because the new members of the academy will have to, to be in conformity with the church's magisterium automatically. But that's mm -hmm. clearly uh, not the case with a few of these new members. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, uh, given what you just said about uh, Archbishop Paglia saying this is a, the Pope's attempt to dialogue with those who don't even agree with the church on issues like life, why the reluctance to dialogue with his own cardinals on something as elementary as marriage, do you think? And do you think this letter, making it public, will initiate the dialogue that those four cardinals have been begging for for the last year? Well, this is the irony, Raymond, because he does want a dialogue with, with everybody else, it seems, but not his own cardinals who have a real problem uh, with the faith and, and trying to uphold the orthodoxy of the faith. So that is, a, that is of great concern to, to, to many of the cardinals, I understand, not just the four who are the dubia four, if you like. Well, uh, whether he will respond to this, it's anyone's guess, but, I, but it seems unlikely at this stage.